multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden soul found liberty at Calvary and let's pray <clears throat> Heavenly Father thank you for what you were willing to do and did do for us on Calvary Lord you shed your blood that could be the only thing to give us forgiveness of sins. So Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would bless our uh, services all over in our building this morning. Lord, I pray that you would um, be with our missionaries this morning. Lord, I pray that you would bless the offering that we're about to take for them. We'll ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Lee. Am I on? I don't know. Can everybody hear me? Is that better? Am I on, Glenn? Yes. All right. Brother Don's going to be passing around the plate as he, uh, we collect the offering for the missionaries that we support during this Sunday school time upstairs and downstairs, listed on the bottom up there. So my kids have been remodeling their kitchen. Uh, they've been accused of counterfeiting. So um, anyways, I think the nuts would probably appreciate that one <laughs> since they did a lot of counterfeiting. Um, anyways, we're going to be continue on, if I can get this thing to work again. Put it there. Well, maybe we'll continue on. So previously, <laughs> as we left off at uh, the Battle of Gideon, boy, that was like, what was that, three weeks ago, I think, something like that? Because so we had our, our break then, and then we had, yeah, it was last year, right? <laughs> that was a good one. We had our break, and then I was uh, sick last week, so um, we're going to go back to the Battle of Gideon, and just as a kind of a reminder where we left off a little bit, we talked a little bit about the call of Gideon, and the Midianites, of course, were oppressing Israel at that time. They'd come up from the south, and they'd come into the area of Ephraim, Manasseh, and they were, they were you know, raiding that whole area. They were burning the fields, taking the food. The, they were forcing the Israelites to to leave their towns and their houses and go up into the hills and mountains and hide in the dens from what was happening there and, and that, that uh, during all those raids. And, of course, Gideon was hiding behind uh, the mill, and he was, he was trying to protect whatever grain that he had gathered for his family and for, for probably for that town there, protect it from the Midianites. And that's when the Lord came and, and, and called him. And, he, and basically, Gideon had that complaint, you know, Lord, <laughs> what happened with all the promises that you had promised our, our fathers or, you know, back, in, back in the day? And the Lord, again, we talked about, didn't, didn't respond to him. You know, the Lord doesn't have to give an excuse or, you know, a reason for the things that he's doing. But what he does instead, he, he kind of really showed Gideon the reason why the, the Midians were attacking and the Lord had allowed them to attack. And, and, and uh, by telling them, what I want you to do first off, Gideon, is I just want you to go. I'm sending you, Gideon. And, but before you go, what you have to do is you have to go and burn down the altar that you're, that's in the grove that's in, in your town there. So Gideon does that at night. He's obedient to that call. He goes and he burns down that altar. Of course, the men of the town are very angry with Gideon. They force to, they come to his dad and where's your son? He's burned down the altar in the grove. We want to take him out and he's, we're going to stone him. And then, of course, his dad sticks up for him. And, uh, and then Gideon, of course, has that. He, uh, the Lord tells him again, he wants you to, to go and you're going you're gonna to deliver Israel from the Midianites. Gideon sends out that fleece. We talked a little bit about that. He's just checking to make sure confirmation of the call. This first time that really he's had this interaction with the Lord. And after he has that, he encourages um, those that are following him. And then we 
started going into um, getting ready for this battle that the Lord is going to lead Gideon into a battle against the Midianites. We talked about where the Midianites had come forth with about 135,000 in their army composed of uh, Malachites and the Midianites, and they were camped at this one area called the Hill of Moriah. And uh, Gideon calls out to uh, several people there in the area, Naphtali and Zebulun and, and Ephraim, and, and they all gather together, several thousand of them, 32,000 Israelites meet at that well of Herod. Over here on the right, last time I think I had it in red, so it didn't show up very well. But each one of those little stick figures there represents 10,000. So the Midianites had 135,000 soldiers, and then, of course, over on the left-hand side, that represents what Israel had, right? So that, boy, that's quite a discrepancy when you look at that. But, of course, we know that uh, the Lord said there's too many, and so I want you to thin it down. And so Gideon says, hey, anybody here who doesn't want to go into battle, who doesn't feel comfortable, or maybe afraid, that's okay. Why don't you leave? And so of that, 32,000, 22,000 go ahead and return home. And if I can get this thing to move for me. Oh, man. There, whoa, too far. So now they're left. Now I spoiled it. Anyways, so now they're left with uh, 10,000 men. And the Lord can, again, he says to Gideon, he says, you know, that's way too many. Now, I mean, that's, you know, that's quite a discrepancy already right there, right? 10,000 against 135,000. And the Lord says, you know, it's too many. Why did the Lord say that? Well, because he wanted to make sure that the Lord would get, be honored, would be glorified for the victory, right? The Lord would receive that glory. And the Lord promised in that, too, that not only that, but he was going to help Gideon, right? So he was calling Gideon. He was going to help Gideon. He was going to enable Gideon. He was going to give him the strength to have victory and also the men. So he cuts it down to 300 men. So that's that little you just top of the guy's head right there. So that's what they had right there. So you had 300 against 135,000. That just doesn't seem possible. But we talked about last time, you know, God is, what's that song? God is the God of impossibilities or something like that. The God of impossible. So, um, and of course, so that's what we have. And so after that, they, of course, um, whoops, went too far. Really moved quick on me there. So um, then we talked a little bit about Gideon, of course. Uh, Gideon was still a little bit unsure. And so the Lord tells him, he says, you know, Gideon, if you're still a little bit hesitant about this, and I think I would be too, right? And I don't think that's, there's anything wrong. You know, the Lord knows our frailties. He knows the, our strengths, our weaknesses. He knows our fears. And so he, is, he, he knew what was in Gideon's heart. Maybe Gideon had maybe a little bit of doubt. He just wanted to trust the Lord. He wanted to go with the Lord. So the Lord says, I tell you what you need to do, Gideon, is you need to go into the camp, and I want you to go into camp. It's at night. And I want you to go to this, this tent here, and you're going to hear something that's going to encourage you. And so Gideon does that. He grabs his, his servant, and they go in there, and they listen. They hear a guy has this dream, and he's in his tent. And he wakes up, and he wakes up his partner. He says, hey, you know, I just had this dream. And he talks about this person coming in, you know, this, this thing rolling in, you know, and the sword and all this. And the guy says, well, that's none other than that's Gideon, right? And he's going to come in, and he's going he's to basically attack us. And so they were afraid. They were afraid of what's going to go, what's going to happen. So Gideon hears this, and he's encouraged. So he goes running back to the 300 guys that are in the camp, and he tells them what's happened. He says, the Lord's given us a victory. So now he's, he's encouraged, so he's going to encourage the 300 that are with him. And so now the next thing that he's going to do, he's, the Lord's going to instruct him to attack at night. And this was, you think back, this is way, you know, this is, this is before night vision goggles like we have now, right? And all the night vision things we have and lights and all that kind of stuff. That was really unheard of to make an attack at night. You know, it's kind of like guerrilla warfare plus 300 people. And so Gideon, so the Lord says, I, w I want you to attack at night, and this is what I want you to do. And so he, uh, so, so the Lord instructs him in what to do, and Gideon's going to be faithful to follow that. And that's kind of where we left off last time. So it was kind of a cliffhanger. So we're back at the, where we are now. So what do they do? So over in Judges, you can follow along. It's, we're in Judges chapter 7, verse 16. And so what he's going to do is over here, you can see, so the Midianites, wherever my uh, pointer is here, somewhere along there. There we go. So the Midianites are camped right in here. 135,000 is their army. 
Right now, Gideon and his 300 soldiers are, are just on the other side of this little valley right here, and they're right there, and they're just getting ready for this battle. And so the Lord's instructed Gideon what to do, and he tells him, first thing, what I want you to do is each one of you 300 are going to take a trumpet in your hand. So you're gonna, in one hand, you're going to have a trumpet. In the other hand, you're going to take, you're going to have a, you're going to have a lantern or a lamp or maybe a, a, some kind of a torch, whatever it is, flashlights. They didn't have flashlights back then right there. So some kind of a lamp or torch, they're going to put that in a, in a clay jar, and it's going to stick that light in there. Why? So that nobody can see it on the outside, right? So it's going to conceal that. And then he says, what I want you to do is I'm going to, I'm going to break you up into groups of 100, and I want you to go out, and I want you to go all the way around the camp. And so that's what they do. So that's, he starts out with telling them about the pictures and getting all that. If we can go to the next slide, I think there, Karen. There we go. So then, so Gideon, he sends out, and he, he, he puts the, the 100 or so, and he scatters them all the way around the 133,000. If you read on down there, it says in Judges chapter 7, verse 19 through 21, so Gideon and the 100 men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. The beginning of the middle watch, that's about 12 a.m. So it's pitch black out there, 12, 12, uh, 12 a.m., so in the middle of the night. Not only is it the middle of the night, but it's right at the time when they're changing guards. So there's going to be, you know, you can just imagine one, one set of guards as they're getting ready to change, they're just getting up. They're just waking up. They're gathering their stuff together, you know. They're not quite awake, you know. They're coming over, you know, and the other guys have been up all night, right? So they're maybe getting a little bit sleepy, a little bit tired. It's time for them to make the change. They're looking forward. They see their buddies coming. Hey, how's it going? He says, yeah, it's going pretty good. Says, yeah, it's been real quiet. Well, that's good. It's been real quiet. I don't expect anything to happen tonight. Maybe tomorrow we'll see what happens. All right, guys, you know, have a good night's sleep. So they go off and they start getting their tents ready to go to sleep while these guys are kind of getting ready. And all of a sudden, then it happens, right? The perfect time. You follow the Lord. His timing is absolutely perfect when we follow the Lord. We may not fully understand why he does the things he, he does, why he asks us to do the things he asks us to do, the timing that he asks us to do them, but his timing is perfect. And this is a perfect time because there's this commotion or confusion that's going on right at the time. So we continue on, and they had newly set the watch, and then all of a sudden you have all these guys pitch black out there, right? Everybody in the camp's probably asleep except for these guards that are moving around. And all of a sudden, these trumpets blow. Can you imagine that? All the way around them. And it didn't matter that there were only 300. It's trumpets blow. It's pitch black. It's quiet. All of a sudden, all these trumpets blow. They blew the trumpets. They break their pitchers. And now, all of a sudden, you hear the trumpets, and you see lighting, all lights all the way around the camp. And you've got to figure, as a soldier, so you, you have no idea how many people are out there. All you see is all the way around us, there's these lamps, and there's a trumpet, and then all of a sudden there's this yell, and they broke the pitchers and held the lamps in their hands and the trumpets in their right hand to blow with all, and they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and they stood up, you know, so all of a sudden, you know, these guys that are on guards, they're like, whoa, what's going on? And then the camp, people are waking up, and they hear this, and they hear the trumpets, they're coming out of their tents, they look out, and they see nothing, but they see all these lights all the way around them. They hear the trumpets all the way around them. I mean, they are just like, they are confused, they don't know what's going on, this is totally out of the normal. And, uh, and they stood every man in the place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. Next slide. This thing's not working again. There we go. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host, and the host fled to Beth uh, Shittah and uh, Zerath. So you can just imagine all of a sudden these guys get up, and they just come out of their camp. They see all the lights. They hear the trumpets, and, and they're just they're afraid. You know, the Lord sends confusion upon them, and they just they just... You know, they're leaving everything. They're just, they're putting a B in for boogie, and they're getting out of there right now. You know, they're starting, they're just running, and they don't know, and they come across a guy, and all they do is they start swinging their swords at one another. They don't know who it is. It's dark. They don't know if this is the enemy coming at me. They don't know if it's their own guy, but there's a whole bunch of them that are killed during that time. So they end up killing a lot, you know, friendly fire, so to speak, right? They end up killing a lot of their own guys. They end up fleeing then, so we got... Right here, so they were in the camp, right? So they were there. Now they start heading down. 
So the remaining, so there's some number, we don't really know how many Midianites were killed. Eventually, 120,000 Midianites are going to be killed during this, during this battle by these 300 or so. And so they start running, they start fleeing down this direction here towards this uh, Beth Shetal and uh, Tobath. Right here, they start going there, and then Gideon's army is going to start flying. That's 24 miles, okay? So that's, that's about 24 miles from the time where their camp is, right up here down to Tabath, right here. So they go about 24. Now Gideon and his 300, they're going to start chasing after him. So we got the next slide there. And the men of uh, Israel gathered themselves out of Naphtali, out of Asher, out of Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. Now it's possibly what this is, we're not really sure, but possibly some of those 20, 31,000, 32,000 that had left hadn't gotten very far when all this came. So maybe they've just turned around and started coming back. I read Roman commentary where uh, they talk about some of the Jewish historians thought that maybe some of those 31,000 had come back to help start helping this pursuit. So they come back and they start pursuing. So now we have the Midianites are coming down here. Gideon's and his 300 are down here. Some of the other, other army are also pursuing, joining in this pursuit. So they continue on, and Gideon sent messengers throughout all Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and take them before the waters of Beth Bora and Jordan. And that's about another 30 miles. So we were right up here in, in Taboth. Now they're down here right, right about where this uh, uh, Beth Bora is, and that's where Ephraim comes in, and they stop the army. They go up and meet the army right there, just about the bend. Sakath is right there. Penuel is right there. So they force this army going off there. There's several, the Ephraimites, they end up capturing two of the four kings that are there. They kill those two kings and probably several other. So the Midian army always keeps on going. They're heading out towards Jordan, out towards the desert there. This is Jordan out over in here, which is now Jordan. Back then it was just part of the desert. So they head out there and Gideon's going to continue to, to trap, you know, to travel, um, to continue to pursue him. Gideon and his 300 are going to pursue him. They come out here, and, and uh, the two kings and 15,000 that are remaining, they continue on to this little town, Kirkow. And Gideon, what he decides to do is he kind of takes off, and he takes off in a different direction. He's going to come back around, and he's going to meet him like this. And so that's, what, that's what's going to happen there. About 15,000, all that were left of the host of the children of Israel, or the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew the sword. So now he's down 300 to 15,000. That's a little more reasonable. That's still a lot, though. So Kirkow, they think they don't really know exactly where Kirkow is, where this town is that they had, but they think there was a small fortress there. So these guys, are they're trying to make it to this fortress because they think, you know, if we can get to this fortress, we're going to be safe. We're going to be secure against whoever starts coming up against us. Plus, we got 15,000 men still and a couple of kings. So they continue on. And a uh, little different map, but basically you can see right here is where, I don't know why that circle keeps on moving on me. But anyways, so we've come down here and we've traveled, you know, down here in Gideon. The men come into this town right here about Kirkow. They got 15,000, like I said, and Gideon's going to sneak around and come here. So, the, so these men are right here. They're thinking Gideon's going to be following them. So they're sitting in the town and they're kind of looking off in one direction, Right. And we get that idea, and Gideon went up by the way of them that dwell in the tents in the east of Nobah to uh, Jogbada and smote the host, for the host were, was secure. They thought they were good. We got 15,000. We're in a secure location. We can see them when they're coming. Well, what they didn't realize was that Gideon was taking them behind for a, attack behind. Man, the Lord was giving Gideon a lot of wisdom in this battle, and he was enabling him to... To defeat him. So that's what happened. And when uh, Zeba and uh, Zalmunna fled, he pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and discomforted them all the host. So they went about 75 to 80 miles. That's how far Gideon, that's how far this, that is when you take a look, kind of the map distance and everything like that. So they pursued him for about 75 to 80 miles. And so they finally catch these kings. They subdue the whole host. So basically, they wiped out the 15,000. So the 135,000 that went up against them, God gave that victory over of, of those men. Um, if I can get this slide to move. There we go. Don't go. So the Lord provided that 
that victory uh, gave him the victory over that. He enabled uh, Gideon with wisdom, as we talked about there, and gave him the wisdom what to do and how to fight and the best time to fight and, and how to pursue him and how to have victory over him. But he also gave him the strength. Can you imagine that? I mean, one good thing about 300 men is you don't have to have a whole bunch of supplies that you have to carry with you. So they could be pretty quick on their feet. They weren't riding horses or camels or anything. They're on their feet going 75 miles. Now, they did come across, we didn't read it, they came across a couple of towns, one with Succoth, and when they're, when they're going there, and they go into town, and they, you know, they've been traveling for 50-some-odd miles you know, from the night before when they, did, they followed them all the way down there, and so they're probably running out of supplies. And so they asked some of the men there, said, you know, can you give us some bread, give us some water, to, you know, because our guys are hungry. And the guy said, you know, you don't have the king in your hand. We're not going to give you anything. So Gideon, he warned him, he said, okay, I'm coming back. After I win this thing, I'm coming back to you guys. They went to the next town, Penuel. Same thing. They asked him for food and water, and they said, no way. You don't have the king's hand. You know. And I might be understand that because you think about where those two towns are. Midian had been coming through that area. Amalekites and Amorites and everybody had been coming through that area. So they may have been afraid, almost caught in a rock in a hard spot. But they still were part of the Israelites. They should have trusted the Lord, trusted Gideon, but they didn't. And yeah, we'll find out what happens. So they pursue them. They go that, they don't have the food and water, 75 miles. And I don't know how many days that took to, to overcome that, but, you know, probably several days uh, traveling. So they have the victory. They, they get the kings and everything like that, and they end up killing those two kings and all the 15. And then when they come back through, they knock down the tower of Penuel, and they take the men out of Succoth, and they basically run them through the, the briars, as it says there. So, so, they, so the Lord has given him this big victory, given him the wisdom, the strength, the endurance, if you will, to continue this pursuit until the victory was complete as he, and he went there. After that, you move into X, or, uh, Judges chapter 8, Judges chapter 8, verses 22 through 23, then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, rule thou over us, both thou and thy sons and thy sons, sons also. So basically what Israel says, man, Gideon, I can't, <laughs> you had this great victory. You beat the Midianites. They're no longer going to be harassing us. Now we can live in peace. Would you be, basically the idea there, would you rule over us, would you be our king? You know, they didn't have a king. So even back then they were still looking, you know, they were still wanting a king. And they said, they asked Gideon to be a king. And he said, and so Gideon's response was, because um, they say, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So when we look at that, you know, Gideon really recognized that the Lord had not given him that authority. Gideon wasn't going to take something that was not given to him by the Lord, right? The Lord had delivered them. And Gideon saying that, you know what? I didn't do this. There's no way I could have done this on my own with 300 men. No, this is the Lord that delivered you. All I did, I'm the Lord's servant. I just followed his, he called me. I followed his instructions. I went, I, I tore down the altars, and I went to the Lord. I worshiped the Lord. He gave me, told me what to do. He told me how to have the victory. He told me where to go. He gave me the wisdom to do it. I was his servant. I followed. It's the Lord that gave the victory. It's all him. And so Gideon realized that, that first off, that it was the Lord. Next thing that he realized was that, you know, it's not, um, the Lord didn't call him to be a judge, or the Lord called him to be a judge, not their king. The call belonged to the Lord and not to the people. So and Gideon realized that, you know, the Lord was calling me to be your judge and not your king. We think about Romans 12, 3 through 8 for us, when we kind of put it in context for us today, for I say uh, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has, um, hath dwelt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So each one of us here, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as your Savior, you've put your faith and trust in him alone, and you've been born again, the Lord's given you, he's gifted you in, in some measure for, to, for minister. And each one of us has been given a different grace gift, if you will. 
and to be able to utilize that to minister to one another. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth as on, on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it sim, uh, with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that soweth, showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And there's a lot of number of other gifts, if you will, that the Lord allows us to, um, to be uh, a, a a blessing to, to the church. So, so Gideon Reddick recognized that call to be the ruler wasn't from him. That was, should have come from the Lord. The other thing that he realized in that when he was saying that, he realized what was really needful for the people, right? If you go all the way back to why the Midians had come there in the first place is because the people had turned their back on the Lord, right? They had started following these, these false gods. They'd raised up altars to, to the false gods, to the gods of the Canaanites and the people that were living in those areas. They built these groves, and so they'd really turned their back on the Lord, and they started following after these other gods. And, and so the Lord was judging them, and so he allowed the Midianites and the Amalekites and all these other people to come in to to try to get them to turn back to the Lord. And one of the first things, again, that he told Gideon to do was, Gideon, before you even go out there, you need to tear down the altar. You need to get rid of these false gods. You need to get rid of these other things that are turning you from me, and you need to turn to me, and you need to repent. And so Gideon realized that. He realized what was needful for the people to do. Not for me to be a king, but what you really need to do is you need to obey the Lord. So first off, you need to do is you need to trust the Lord. And that's, you know, really what Gideon did, right? He trusted the Lord throughout this whole thing. I mean, he really had no relationships whatsoever. Well, that, not that we know of. Maybe he did to some extent. He obviously knew what had happened, the promises of the Lord. He probably was familiar with the stories of how the Lord delivered the people out of Egypt and the miracles and all that stuff and what Joshua had done to, to conquer that area. I'm sure he knew about all that stuff, but he really didn't have a relationship with the Lord, not until this point. And so, but through that, through the Lord just being with him and showing him some mercy and some grace and, and during the time when he was putting out the fleece and testing and all that, he was trusting the Lord and then he continued to trust it. But not only that, but he also acknowledged the Lord. He acknowledged the Lord, you know, it's you, Lord, that's going to enable me. It's you, Lord, that's going to give me wisdom. It's you, Lord, as long as I'm faithful to you and following after you, you're going to enable me to do the things that you've called me to do. And that's what he was realizing. So he's trying to tell the people this. You need to trust the Lord. You need to acknowledge him, but also you need to fear him. You need to revere him in all of this because that's really when we truly fear the Lord, when we have a fear for the Lord, that's, we're going to follow him and we're going to trust him. And I'm not saying cowering in fear, but it's just a standing in awe of who he is. And man, can you imagine the how Gideon would have been standing in awe to see what the Lord had done with 300 men against 135,000 men. I mean, he would have just been in, in awe of what the Lord had done for him. And so Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 says, most of us are probably very familiar with this verse. I think it's a really, it's a good verse to memorize and commit to memory. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, not with a part of your heart, not with a portion of your heart, not even with 99.9% .9 of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's a tough thing to do. There's certain times I know where I don't always trust the Lord, and uh, I need to confess that. And lean not into thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So that's really, we're going to, we'll stop right there. There's some other things that happen in Gideon's life, not so pleasant, um, but you can, you can read those a little bit later. But um, as we continue on looking at these battles, the next battle that we have is the battle with the Philistines. And we know that uh, the Philistines were a major thorn in the side of Israel's, in the side of Israel, right? I mean, all the way through from the time of when they were going through the conquest, all the way through the kings, basically, the Philistines are going to be a major stumbling block and, and battle, especially during the period of the judges. They never, during the period of, of um, Joshua, 
at the conquest and judges, they never succeed in kicking the Philistines completely out of that area that they were promised from the Lord. That would include the, um, the tribes of Judah, the tribes of, um, tribes of Judah, Ephraim, a little bit of Benjamin, not so much Benjamin, but Ephraim and Manasseh mainly are the tribes that, um, and Dan, that are uh, unsuccessful in kicking out the Philistines from the property or from the, um, from the promised land. But what we want to do is we want to go all the way into uh, 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel, and uh, we're going to see this battle. It's one of the, one of really kind of the last major battles with the Philistines. And uh, uh, Samuel is the judge at this time of, of Israel. And um, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 4, if you want to turn there, you can read there, but we have the verses up here. So lead up into the battle. 1 Samuel 4, 1 through 3. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle, pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of the Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So as we take a look at this, and we take a look at at this this time frame here, what we're looking at is a little background to this battle. This battle takes uh, place early 12,000 B.C. or so around that time. So our timeline, if you're looking at it in our, in our Bible and the way our Bible's arranged, you basically have the judges, which we went through the period of the judges. Then you have the book of Ruth. Ruth would also have occurred, that time frame would have occurred during the period of the judges. And then you move into First and Second Samuel, and then you have First and Second Kings. And of course, Samuel really is kind of the beginning of Samuel, just before the just before the um, monarchy takes over with King Dave or King Saul and then King David. So you have right at the end of the period of the judges. It's interesting because some people think that Samuel and Samson were lived about the same time period, time frame. But we'll maybe see that in a little bit later. So that's the timeline. A little bit of geography as we're looking at it. Where, where are we talking about here? So basically when you look at it, you have the, the plain of Sharon, the plain of Philistia, and the hill country. And so what we're looking at is this kind of this area right over here. Let me pull this back again. So this is the Dead Sea right here. This is Jordan coming up here. This is the Sea of Galilee. So what we're talking about here really is the plain of Philistines. So this is where the, the Philistines controlled this area right here. This would be about where Judah and Simeon is. And then you have Ephraim kind of in this area right here. And then you have the, the plain of Sharon right here. And then this hill country is up in the mountains, the mountains area kind of stretching out through all along the, the east side of or the west side of the Jordan River. And some of the towns that we have that we looked at, just read about here, we have Aphek which is right about here. So again, the Philistines control this area right here. So you have Aphek. You have uh, Shiloh, which is going to be another main town here. And then you have this area right here where the Israelites were stationed right there, um, referred to as Ebenezer, or stone of help is what that really means. Most people, most commentators and historians really don't know where this town of Ebenezer was. And it actually is a reference here. It wasn't really a place at the time of this battle, but it was named afterwards, and it's found in um, 1 Samuel chapter 7. Whoops, I don't have the verse up there, but 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, where uh, Samuel, the, the Israelites have a victory over the Philistines, and we'll see that after a little while. Maybe not this week, maybe next week we'll pick it up. But they have victory over it, and um, uh, Samuel is going to set up a stone and call it Ebenezer, stone of our help, when the Lord gives them victory over the, over the Philistines. Okay, so anyway, so the campaign that we're looking at is the battle with the Philistines. The combatants, again, are Israel and the Philistines. Mainly, when we're talking about Israel here, we're talking about the, the tribes of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Benjamin. So basically what we're looking at, again, here's, here's Manasseh right here, kind of this purplish color. Ephraim sits right in here in the middle. And then Benjamin and Dan are right, kind of right along this area here. And, uh, and then, of course, the Philistines. So what we have is we have a little bit of history now. Hopefully you don't mind a little history. 
Um, I actually enjoy history a little more than what I did when I was in high school and college. I could care less about it, but I find it very fascinating to find out where some of the, some of the history uh, of, of some of these nations come from. It's a little bit of a help. So who are the Philistines then? I mean, really, when we look at it, who are the Philistines? Just uh, So I pulled some information out of... Um, there's a couple of commentaries to, to help us with this. So again, what we're looking at here is we're looking at Israel is right, you know, basically right here. Egypt's down here. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Turkey would be up in this area. So the Philistines all come out from way over here. So basically what it says at the beginning of the 12th century BC, various groups of sea peoples, as they called them, that's what the historians called them, were sea peoples, had been moving across um, east, across the Mediterranean from the Aegean, basically from the area of Greece and up and around that area, Italy and everything. And they had overrun the Minoan civilization of Crete and then colonized the western seacoast of Israel. So basically what they did is they came across the Mediterranean Sea. They took over a lot of these areas, Crete and, and uh, Cyprus, and they moved in and they basically settled out throughout most of this area and moved all the way down even into northern part of Egypt. And then what we have, in the north, they came to be known as the Phoenicians. So up here, um, this is where uh, Syria is, up in, up in this area right here. So the Phoenicians settled up right up in here, and the Philistines all settled down here along this coast of where Israel is now that we're talking about. Um, in the south, the Philistines. Ramses III had been able to drive them north out of Egypt, so basically when Ramses III drove the, the Phoenicians or the, the Philistines up and over here, and so that's why they settled into this area right here. Um, out of Egypt about 1190 B.C. into what we now know as the Gaza Strip. Of course, the Gaza Strip, we've heard that probably plenty of times in the news. And so where's the Gaza Strip? Well, that's right down here. So this is a map of modern Israel current what it looks like now so the Gaza Strip when you see that in the news that's this area right down here um, just off of uh, the border of Egypt and part of Egypt or part of Israel so that's where the Philistines were kind of stuck and then most of us have probably heard the idea of the West Bank and this area right here is when you hear that in the news this is the West Bank Jerusalem is, is right in that area part of the West Bank so that's kind of the modern uh, if you will of what it, what it really looks like um, they brought with them, uh, with, the Phoenici or with the Philistines at that time, or the sea peoples brought with them, was, uh, of course, their language that they had and the dress and the pottery. But the most importantly, what they were is they, they had already developed smelting. And they had all their weapons, or most of their weapons were iron, made of iron. Whereas most of the area of the Israelites were still in the Bronze Age, these people had moved in iron. Iron is much more, it's, a, it's much sturdier, it's much harder um, when you're fighting with a sword than somebody has a bronze or maybe a stone. You know, Israelites were still in that, in that kind of that age of the Bronze Age. So they had much better weapons. Not only that, but they also had... Um, they had horses, that they rode horses, and that was something that was very new to the Israelites at that time, is they had the chariots, and Israelite was, Israelites were familiar with chariots, but they also, their army rode on horses. So they had like a cavalry. Well, that was very new to them. And you can imagine the advantage of having a cavalry along with the chariots, with Israel didn't have either of those things, plus the iron weapons that they had. So they had a much superior weapon force, if you will, than what the Israelites did at that time. And so they came up into that area. And so um, during the conquest, of course, we talked a little bit about this during the time of Joshua when they're moving in there, Israel was unable to completely get the Philistines out of that area, mainly because of the equipment and the, the type of materials that they had. Joshua 13, 1 through 2 says, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth, all of the borders of the Philistines, and, the Gers and then you go on and there's other areas. But basically you can see, so all the way back in that time. And um, although the, um, you know, they had this allocation, Manasseh, as we mentioned, Manasseh and Dan and, and Ephraim were really unable to drive the Philistines out of those, out of those areas all the way up to their coast because their, their land, their allotment went all the way to the coast of the Mediterranean. 
but they were unable to drive them out. And actually what Dan does is kind of interesting. What Dan is going to do, because they couldn't do this, they actually send a contingent up north into what is now Syria, and they, they establish an area up which is going to become Dan up, up, up in the north. And we see that um, basically what you have. So Dan is right down here. They have a port, their, their um, inheritance extent, if you can barely see the arrow here, all the way out to the coast, but they were unable to, to completely dry the Philistines out. So they send a contingent all the way up here to this area, and they establish the area of Dan up here. So they have kind of two areas that you're looking at for Dan. It's found in Judges 134. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not suffer them to come down into the valley. Jo- Judges 18.1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. In those days, the tribe of Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. Well, we know why. <laughs> they couldn't get rid of the Philistines. Judges 18, 26 through 29, and children of Dan went their way and came to Laish. And Laish is way up here somewhere. Oh, there we go. So Laish is a little town way up here. Again, it's up in what is now a part of Syria. Uh, Unto the people that were quiet and secure, so they felt pretty secure. They didn't have anything to worry about, at least they didn't think. And they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. And they built in this verse, uh, um, whoops, I forgot to put the verse down there. Oh, well. Um, And they built a city and dwelt there. Oh, no, that's right, 26 to 29, sorry. Uh, And dwelt therein, and they called the name of the city Dan after the after the name of Dan, their father, who was born to Israel, albeit the name of the city was Laish at first. So they take off and they kind of go up there. Well, what that caused, because they couldn't get those guys out of there, of course, so I press the red button, as a result, those areas were really then open to attack for the Philistines. And so this is kind of where we're coming in here. So the Philistine dominion, uh, domination, if you will, began before the birth of Samson and uh, would last 40 years. That's found in Judges 13. We'll see that in a little bit. Ending under the judgeship of Samuel, 1 Samuel 7. Although um, Israel would battle the Philistines throughout that whole period, really the the Philistines, again, they would be a a thorn in their side, if you will, all the way through the period of the king. So you see that all the way through that, that period. So so that, that area, because they weren't able to do that, Philistines kind of moved up into that area. So that kind of brings us, um, well, yeah, Judges 13, 1 through 3, and then 5, 5b and 24. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them in the hand of the Philistines 40 years. And there was certain man of Zorah, the fam, family of Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not. But thou shalt conceive and bear a son. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. The woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. So that was the time when the Philistines started to dominion. And now we get into 1 Samuel 7, 13 through 14. So the Philistines were subdued. This is after these first battles here that we're going to look at. And they came no more to the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron, even unto Gath, and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. So that brings us to this first encounter. If my uh, clicker will work here. There we go. So we have the first confrontation, and uh, we'll go ahead and stop there because, um, and we'll pick that up. I was hoping to get to about this spot, so this is a good place, kind of leave you hanging a little bit, you know, and you'll have to come back next week to see what happens. Does Israel win? Does Israel lose? Ah, we have to come back and see what happens. Anyways, let's go ahead and close in the word prayer. Our Father, we do want to thank you for this time you've given us this morning to, to look into your word and, and look at some of these battles. And, and Father, we thank you for the things that we can learn Um, even during these times from the life of Gideon and his faithfulness in you, trusting you, acknowledging you, Father, and then also fearing you. So, Father, we just uh, want to pray for Pastor this morning. You would strengthen his voice. Father, help us to come prepared and ready to hear from you what you have for us this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.